how's the start of preseason been for you? Uh, it's been really good. Yeah, we really, really like our group. Um, really are excited. Um, yeah, about what we have. You know, got off to a great start, beating Irvine in our first exhibition, and uh, yeah, got a got a really good one tonight. Um, against um, Cal Baptist. So so we're we're pretty excited. Yeah, definitely. I mean, getting results in preseason is always important. I'm also always curious. I mean, with your conference and. You know, I know your out of conference schedule is very, very difficult. I mean, especially compared to some other teams. You know, how do you kind of manage? You know, getting off to such, you know, playing so many important matches so much early on in the season, not really having a let up. You know, throughout the course of your season too. How do you, how do you prepare over the course of preseason to have such a difficult schedule throughout the course of the year? Yeah, it's it's so interesting in our conference. Um, you know, with the, with the double round robin, um, and everyone having you know, pretty differing styles of play. Certainly Washington and Stanford, you know, are a bit more direct, a bit more press heavy. Um, you know, Oregon State and UCLA kind of want to dominate, you know, possession of the ball and um, kind of control that game, um, you know, that way. So I think for me, it's trying to find opponents that, you know, prepare us for those styles specifically, um, you know, and then prepare us for the intensity, you know, of those matches. Um, not having a conference tournament, you know, every game in the Pac-12 is really like a conference final. So, you know, you have to be prepared, um, you know, for that little bit of an extra, um, you know, intensity that goes into each match. So we try and just replicate that as best we can, you know, with some of our non-conference games while still, you know, as you know, trying to give the players confidence that, uh, you know, you can go in and and uh, do do what you need to do to make the uh, the NCAA tournament. Yeah, you know, obviously, I think you make a great point there at the end. And I think, you know, that balance of how you approach the schedule to me is really interesting as well. I mean, obviously, you know, your conference is very unique and you play, you know, very high level opponents twice a year. I mean, there's really no other conference in the country like that. But also, I mean, you talk about how you're finding opponents specifically to prep for this, but also at the same time, like you said, I mean, the NCAA tournament is always you know, at the forefront of making the decision. So is that process difficult in finding specific teams, you know, especially when you're somewhat regionalized? Yeah, I know you guys travel a little bit more than other programs, but it's not like you're a professional club or anything like that and just can just go wherever you want. Is that difficult to find specific opponents that meet the level you want to find, but also the specific tactical identities you're looking for in an opponent? Yeah, I mean, I probably... uh watch more college soccer than I care to admit. So, um, you know, I, you know, then that's part of it is just trying to, yeah, you know, take notes on, on certain opponents that, you know, will match up, you know, obviously some of it's budgetary. We're pretty lucky, you know, within California that, you know, we can drive, you know, and find a lot of quality opponents, um, you know, with these differing styles, but I think also it's, it's fun to get out of region and play someone new, you know, every year because of that, double round robin you know some of these guys if you end up playing those games and we kind of play usd every year you know they end up playing like the same i think like 65 percent of their games are against the same teams you know over their four years so i also want to give the guys you know different experiences of playing different opponents and seeing different parts of the country i thought i was really lucky in my you know my playing career and also in my coaching career so far to see different parts of the country and you know go and do cultural things washington dc you know visit the 9 11 site when we've been in new york and you know different things like this i think is you know also important and a part of that whole student athlete experience yeah definitely i think, I think you make a very good point there about you know factoring the student athlete experience as well and also i mean you know playing the like you said, you know, the same 65% of your opponents each year, you know, I think it's, it's important to have that little bit of balance. And, you know, you talked a little bit about your coaching and, you know, your different coaching stops along the way and also your playing career. But, you know, if we could just kind of start from the beginning and talk to a, a little bit about, you know, your time at Concordia way back in the day. I mean, I know obviously you had a lot of success there as a player and then obviously eventually as a coach, but, you know, if you could just talk about, you know, your time playing there and what that meant to you, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's like all of us, you know, I think that college career is so impactful in your life. You're going to meet, you know, lifelong friends, obviously, you know, hopefully pursue, um, uh, you know, we all have professional aspirations, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, obviously having the balance of making sure that we have, 
you know, something to prepare for, for life after college too. And I think that was really, you know, really important for me. I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. I was, you know, pre-law political science major in college and, um, you know, now here I am in, in coaching. So it's kind of funny. You never know, you know, where your pathway leads, but I think that, you know, and I tell this all the time to recruits or, you know, when we do college talks at our camps and stuff, I think it's about finding the right fit for you. And, you know, that was a perfect fit for me. I wanted to, you know, stay relatively close to home and I wanted to play right away as a goalkeeper. Um, you know, I was a little bit undersized as a goalkeeper. So, you know, um, you know, it was finding that, like I said, that that right fit. And for me, you know, I have lifelong friends, you know, from that experience, you know, my left back in college, I'm, you know, the godfather to his three year old son. So there's, you know, I think there's things like that, that you can't put a price tag on no matter where you are. So I think it's all about, you know, finding that right fit and, you know, certainly did that. And I think I really, you know, found my appetite for building programs, you know, when I went there, you know, as a freshman, they were 0 and 18 the year before, um, you know, by the time we left, we, you know, had made the national tournament and, you know, by 2007, when I had been coaching, we were in the, you know, national final. So it was a pretty, you know, rapid experience. So I kind of seen that growth and how to build a program and mistakes along the way and successes along the way and everything, you know, in, in between. So, um, I think that really shaped me and it really, um, you know, kind of set me up for this career in coaching. I was still probably at that time, not a hundred percent sure I wanted to be a coach, um, you know, but I enjoyed certainly the college part of impacting, you know, student athletes life because I had such an impactful experience. Um, and I think that's what's kept me in college coaching at, you know, all my stops along the way. Um, and I've, you know, taken somewhat some something from everywhere I've been. And I've been really blessed to, you know, work under great people and work with great people and work at awesome, you know, universities and, um, you know, fortunate now to be, you know, the head coach here at San Diego State. Yeah, completely. I mean, I think the way you kind of summarized you up your time in Concordia of, you know, going in as a freshman, obviously you you had expectations, you had specific reasons to go there, but see that, you know, complete transition from going to 0 and 18 to by the time in 2007, like you said, you know, in a national tournament, I think speaks volumes. And, and I'm also curious, you talk about this idea of, you know, kind of building a program and how important that was for you. You know, when you first went there as a player was, I mean, obviously I know you did not have necessarily aspirations at the time to become a coach, but you know, how much along the way in terms of being a player, did you kind of envision yourself maybe being a coach and really embrace that di idea of building a program? Because to me, it sounds like that was definitely something that, you know, kept you there. Obviously, you had a ton of success here in the NAI All-American, but also, you know, motivated you to become into co going into coaching after and, you know, helping the program find even more success after you were done playing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I've always been a huge, you know, huge sports fan, um, you know, and I think during that, you know, time, I, I just learned the power of, of teams and the power of, you know, believing in great things and, you know, working really, really hard towards those um, and and seeing, you know, that anything is really possible if if you want to, you know, all row in the right direction and, and get behind, a, you know, an idea. And I think, I think that was probably the most powerful thing. And I wanted to stay, you know, I think when I got to the end of that, you know, I wanted to stay in that environment, you know, whatever it was, even if it was working at a law firm, you know, or something like this, it was about, you know, harnessing that collective group and that collective belief to, you know, do, do whatever you want or whatever the goal is, you know, all together. So I think I always knew that. And I, you know, it was probably easier just to find that in coaching, um, you know, and, you know, I think certainly at the university level, um, it's, it's what's kept me there. I think it's just a bit more pure than the professional level in terms of, yeah, those experiences, um, you know, that, uh, you know, kind of kept me going. Yeah, completely, you know, completely agree with, you know, the collegiate level and that aspect of it too. And I also, you know, your overall main message that I think makes a lot of sense. And, you know, moving forward in your next stop along the coaching career, you know, I know Cal Poly was your first, you know, division one job. And, you know, I know you have obviously a lot of success there with the program, but I mean, that I also know that was one of your biggest first tastes into recruiting. You know, I know you had a ton of um, success there in terms of recruiting. So, you know, I'm curious how that stop was for you and, you know, working at a completely different level, you know, completely different set of rules, NAI versus NCAA, and also, you know, having quite a bit of success in the overall landscape of recruiting and helping Cal Poly have some couple of very good years. 
Yeah. And I, I think, you know, it was another place that was, you know, still building, you know, Paul Holler, um, you know, who kind of revitalized that program, you know, I would say, you know, it was amazing to work under him, someone that's, you know, so driven and so committed <laughs> to the program. And um, I think I, yeah, that really, really got me a taste for it. And it was tough. I mean, that was a hard you know, in terms of just like physically recruiting there, you're four hours from the Bay Area, you're four hours from Southern California, you know, two hours from Fresno or Baker. So there isn't a ton of local talent. So yeah, it, it really taught me the power of how hard you have to work at recruiting and creating relationships and, you know, just putting, you know, the time and, you know, quite honestly, the miles, the, you know, my, my partner in crime there at the time, Brian, you know, he works in the Colorado Rapids uh, front office, you know, we would get up at, we'd rent a car and we'd wake up at six in the morning, we'd drive four hours, you know, either to Northern California or Southern California. And this was when it was the old DA and get there for the 10 o'clock, you know, U17 game, U16, U17 game, stay for the 12 o'clock U19 game and drive home. And we were, you know, home by, you know, 6 p.m. Now, I think when you're, you know, I think we were 25 and 26 years old at the time and single, you know, life is a little bit, a little bit different, um, you know, then, but those were some special, yeah, special times, I think just some special people and, you know, what we were able to create and, you know, the, um, the fan experience. I learned so much about harnessing, you know, the fans and harnessing um, a community that really believes in the team. Um, and I, I think that's something that's I've really carried, um, you know, along my ways too. Yeah, completely. You know, I'm glad you touched on, you know, that kind of the community aspect of Cal Paul. I mean, I know they have one of the best atmospheres sometimes in all of college soccer, but I think, you know, focusing on the recruiting aspect here, I think, you know, some of the main takeaways are really interesting to me. There is, you know, the idea of recruiting and, you know, I know I've spoken to other coaches too, the idea of a niche and I know Cal Poly has a lot of niches, but, you know, you make a really good point here in that, you know, San Luis Obispo, it doesn't exactly have, you know, great direct access to any part of the country. So how big was it establishing relationships with these clubs, but also just individual relationships with these players in terms of, you know, like you said, constantly being there, you know, whether it's at a game on the weekend, you know, I think a lot of players, you know, if they see a coach continually come out to their games, I think that idea of a relationship gets magnified anymore. So how much of important was establishing a personal relationship with the individual players and also more of a collective relationship with the clubs? Yeah, absolutely. And I felt I was I was pretty, you know, lucky because, you know, when I was playing and coaching at Concordia, my, my head coach runs, um, you know, Irvine Strikers, obviously, which is, you know, one of the big youth clubs now strikers. I don't know if they're FC or SC. I can't keep all these together. But, you know, one of the top, I would say, non MLS academies in, you know, in the entire country. So I feel I was pretty blessed. That was a great, you know, jumping off point and really carried me in those first years having those relationships in Southern California with them and Real Socal at the time, Patty Adores, you know, served down in San Diego. So really being able to, you know, carry those relationships, um, you know, having, you know, done a bit of time in the, you know, Orange County club circuits. Um, so I think that really, really helped me. And I think it allowed me, you know, when talking to recruits, I could relate to the places that they were from. You know, I grew up in Huntington Beach, obviously went to college in Irvine. So, you know, I knew the places that they were from. I knew their high schools. I knew the places that they ate, you know, so I think it allowed you to have, yeah, more of that personal relationship of just being in there and really kind of going through what they went through, of you know, kind of that Orange County club scene and um, high school and, you know, things of that nature. So I think that allowed me to have that. And um, I think that's something I've really carried, you know, throughout my career is I think I'm a very relational coach here. Um, you know, so I think creating those personal relationships is, is so, so important in this recruiting process. Um, you know, especially in this world of, you know, the transfer portal and, you know, switching clubs as a youth player. And, you know, we got kids now making announcements on Twitter that they're switching a youth club at U14, you know, so it's just a crazy world. So I think even more so those personal relationships and really understanding, you know, the person that you're getting, um, you know, their character, what's important to them, what their core values are, um, I think is uh, super, super paramount. Yeah, I think completely agree with everything you said there. And I think, you know, when you talk personal relations, you know, actually relating to a player, I think is so important. And I think a lot of an aspect that a lot of people don't even think about it, you know, just I think there's the very much in terms of a player coach relationship and, you know, trying to create it that way. But I think, you know, actually relating and, you know, really relating them with emotional and bonding 
bonding level is so important. I think that's a great example. And, you know, kind of progressing a little bit forward in your career too. I know you had a brief one year stop at Wisconsin, but you know, I wanted to focus on your time at Denver. You know, you've obviously spoken a lot about this episode so far about the idea of program building. And I think, you know, that's a great example. I know when you came to Denver, I mean, they were somewhat a respectable program, but, you know, in your time at Denver, you really, you brought them more success arguably than they ever had before and really put them on a national map. So you could just speak a little bit about on your time at Denver and, you know, what you took away from that and what it meant to you. That'd be great. Yeah. Denver was such a special time in my career and, you know, we're, we're opening up the season um, there next week. You know, we were fortunate. We, they came out here and played us last year. We were, um, you know, able to knock them off two to one when they were ranked number, I think five in the country. So that was a really, really fun win. And I think the guys, you know, probably, you know, I tried not to make it about me or make it too big of a deal, but the guys, I think, you know, understood and, you know, they made it a pretty special experience for me. So um, I appreciated that. So um, we're, we're looking forward to that match next week and just see this sp- stomping grounds and, you know, where we had so many good memories, especially on that field. We had so many big wins and so many heartbreaks too, and so many fun days of training and so many hard days of training too. And um, I think it's just all those experiences, you know, that you carry with you. And I just, you know, I think that place really taught me the power of culture, um, you know, and, and building, um, you know, core values into an organization and, you know, believing in, you know, what your principles are and, and not wavering from those, you know, Jamie Franks is, you know, one of my best friends, we were assistants at the time. And then obviously he became the head coach when, when Bobby Muse left the Wake Forest, um, and, uh, his unwavering belief in the culture and, you know, doing things the right way, um, recruiting through character first, um, you know, that's the bedrock for, you know, the success of that program. Um, you know, and I, you know, followed his lead and, you know, obviously added in my own, you know, expertise where, where we needed it. Um, but, you know, I think just that foundation of culture was, was so, so powerful there and continues to be powerful there. Even when, you know, maybe a year or two, you're a little bit lighter on talent. I think that culture of, you know, being in a high performing environment where everybody literally it's simplest way I can say it is just show up every day, work hard and do your best. And, you know, that's it. And you're going to be surrounded by like-minded people who want to do the same things. And, you know, I think again, anything is possible when, when you have everybody going in the same direction. Yeah, completely agree with everything you said there. And I think, you know, the point you kind of bring up the end is really interesting to me. And obviously, I mean, that group had a ton of talent at this point in time. And, you know, obviously it was a very, you know, talented group throughout, but, you know, you talk about the idea of culture and how important that was. And, you know, I'm curious, You, I think you see it, you know, at the time DU was obviously making a rise and becoming more and more well-known. How important was that aspect in kind of getting your players to embrace it? Hey, you know, we might not be the most talented group out here. You know, we might not match toe-to-toe with the Wake Forest or North Carolina or, you know, other big programs at the time. But, you know, our level of culture of, you know, we're trying to create this environment where we want to become one of the top teams. How does that process kind of look like? Because I know even as a player myself, it's difficult to kind of readjust expectations when you might know that, you know, talent wise, you might not be able to match up with these top teams in the country yet. You know, during your time at DU, even, you know, despite losing some talent, you guys made obviously many deep runs in the NCAA tournament. So what does that process kind of look like? And I think it, it's, you know, what you brought up earlier, I think it all starts in the recruiting process. And we were very deliberate about, you know, finding maybe some under the radar kids. Obviously, you're from Colorado, um, I believe. So, you know, that's a very talent rich state um, that not a lot of people can recruit from. It's hard to, you know, it not hard to get there, but it's just isolated to get there, you know, recruiting wise. And, you know, there's only two division one programs in the state. So, um, any kid that is going to school out of state, they're going to same, you know, pay the same price as DU. So um, I think that, you know, certainly helped is that we really want to focus on keeping Colorado kids at home that would fight a little bit more for their shirt. I mean, we had kids, you know, which is hilarious. I mean, we had kids that in that final four team that were our ball boys at 12 and 13 years old, you know, on the sidelines. And I think they're going to fight a little bit more for the jersey. They're going to believe a little bit more. Um, and give you that little bit of extra 5% when you're in those big games um, that allow you to come out on top. And I thought that, you know, was, was number one. And again, I think, you know, I really learned that, you know, at Cal Poly and then carrying that over. Jamie obviously had that from his experience playing at Wake Forest. 
um, you know, and bringing that over, um, you know, to, to Denver. So, you know, I think that, and then, you know, like our captain was Sam Hamilton, who was like on Russia's third team. Like <laughs> we were just like, who is this guy? But he covers every braided glass. He never loses a tackle unbelievable character and you know he worked his way up even while we were recruiting him and ended up being on you know the rush da team at the time and now he's made an unbelievable professional career for him he's the captain of new mexico united who's also coached by a denver uh denver assistant who our captain from last year is playing for there and they play loyal tomorrow so we're taking the whole team uh tomorrow so you just see kind of those you know, funny how, you know, how small the soccer world works and all those, you know, special relationships, you know, create, but we really want to find under the radar kids and even, you know, guys like Courtney Ford and Andre Shinyashiki and Andre, you know, and Reagan Dunk that ended up being, you know, really, really high draft picks. I can promise you these guys were not really, really <laughs> high draft picks when they got to us. So I think it was finding, you know, those strong character guys that we felt like had a, you know, a ceiling, you know, still to go and then focusing on player development. Um, and, you know, we had a saying that, you know, if players want to be developed, they'll be developed in our system. Um, and if they don't, you know, then they're not. So, you know, I think those were the, we really felt like our best recruiting was also our player development that we could develop players to play in our system very, very well. Um, they needed to be hard nosed because of the work that we required um, them to do on both sides of the ball. Um, but I really feel like it was a combination of that recruiting and, you know, and player development. Um, and really, I think the number one character thing that we looked for was was competitive. Um, and Andre Shinyashiki was literally the most competitive person I've ever met in my life. Like we had to tone it down in training a lot. Um, there was like some days like Andre, you're you're done with training for the day. Um, you know, but you know, I think it started to permeate, you know, through the, you know, through the team. Um, you know, and I think that was a huge, huge catalyst, you know, for our success because we just never felt like you know, we were ever out of a game. Um, and, you know, I think that really carried us a long, long way. Yeah. I mean, I can completely speak on a lot of those aspects. I mean, I'm actually from the same town as Sam Hamilton and I knew yeah. he was a little yeah. kid. And I know his family pretty well. So I think yeah. it's a cool story and I've seen his story a lot, but, you know, getting back to kind of the main message here, you know, you talk about player development a lot and I know you, that steam is kind of carried over to obviously San Jose State and Virginia, you know, with guys like Daryl DK and CJ Fadre, but, you know, I'm curious what, player development looks like from a collegiate setting because I think a lot of times people think of player development and you know you might think of a European setting where obviously you're playing games year round and you know implementing a youth player through the first team or you know their system something like that but the collegiate system is so different I mean such a short season obviously of the spring and that's the developmental aspect but you know, I think it, one of the most challenging things is for a college coach or just running a college program is you know developing players who might not necessarily be ready to play it you know, the games right away, but also developing them over a course of a season. So what was kind of the developmental strategy you guys implemented at DU that allowed you guys to have so much success with guys that weren't exactly, you know, blue chip recruits or guys that, you know, might've been the most talented players coming in? Well, I think that's really, it's, it's a really interesting piece. Um, and I think like each school's um, school calendar actually plays a really interesting part in that. Like DU was a quarter school. So we could actually, you know, you're in the first month of the season with no games. And then by the time you're, you know, you're in the playoffs, you're done with that quarter too. So like, you know, in comparison, you know, at Denver, when we we're in the final four, you know, all of the guys are done with finals at Virginia, we're in the final on Monday, Georgetown, guys are taking finals on the Monday of the championship game. You know, so it's just, it's, it's a really interesting, I think that school calendar actually plays a really big part of it. And we can train till almost till, you know, the middle towards the end of June. Um, you know, so I thought that was really interesting of that school calendar piece, I think has really been um, an interesting part of it. And I think, um, you know, on the other side of it, it's just trying to figure out, you know, different ways to, like you said, how can we get it to a 10 month season? How can we get it to, you know, 30 some odd games? And, you know, for us, it's, you know, we're able to use the 18 games in the fall. You know, we use six games in the spring. We always play an international team so we can get that six game. Last spring, for instance, we played four professional teams. So we try and expose the guys, you know, to that side of it. And then, you know, we utilize the USL2 system um, very, very well. I think we had 15 guys play USL2. Obviously, guys go really, really far. Christian Ingman, you know, as a champion, we've had, 
you know, last year, our captain, Henry Smith Hastry, won the title with Ventura County Fusion. Um, so we got back to back champions from, you know, from that league. And so that's where we can kind of get, OK, we get 18 games, six in the spring, you know, maybe eight to 10 games in the summer. And now we're getting to about 30 games. And again, it's about creating those relationships with the USL2 programs of coaches we really, really trust to take care of our players and, you know, make sure they're getting the proper training. Um, you know, and then I think in house, I think it's just really a holistic view. Um, you know, I really believe in the sports performance side of things. And so we use catapult very, very extensively, you know, in combination with our strength and conditioning coach and our athletic training. Um, you know, we're in constant communications and I kind of just view that as a whole sports performance, um, you know, department. And then I think it's, you know, on the other side of it is, you know, really, you know, I'm, you know, I would say more in charge of the bigger things, themes of the whole team and those kind of things. And my two assistant coaches are more, you know, on the IDP side and individual video and different things like that. So we really utilize, you know, I think that side of it to make sure, um, you know, each player is getting what they need. We also carry a smaller roster. We only have 27 players on the roster and that's on purpose. It's a little bit like scary this time of year because we got coaches in training we got you know goalkeepers in training but you know for me i think it's 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 crucial for that player development for us to be able to invest you know in our players i really believe human capital is our number one resource um and you know if i really believe that then i have to invest the time you know in in that area um so and you know we're very very um I would say deep into analytics and, and video, which, you know, film every one of our sessions with video. Every player has a, you know, Spideo app. I think we're probably doing video every single day. If it's, you know, sometimes a one minute clip or two clips from training that I just want to show, you know, we'll watch it real quick before we go up to training and we utilize um, Y Scout pretty extensively for, you know, um, you know, data analysts, not, not only for team KPIs, but, you know, player KPI. So, you know, like I said, I think it's just a pretty robust individual and, you know, collective, you know, player development model. Yeah, that's fantastic insight into, you know, I think the overall program structure and, you know, what you guys are doing, but I think also, you know, the little things and, you know, talking about scouting, but I think, you know, going back to the player personnel, I think that's a fantastic example, like you said, of, you know, if you are investing in this human capital, you might as well do it all out. And, you know, like you said, it's <laughs> I mean, difficult this time of year when there's 27 guys in training. Yeah. You know everything like that in the preseason but you know something that kind of struck me as a, a curious point is you talked about usl too and i think you know it's a fantastic example of using the resources around you the structure everything like that but you know i know sometimes it's difficult to have players buy into that usl2 structure even when you have like the relationships in place so you know is this something that i think we might be we, i might have to resend you the link here okay, okay. No no, we'll wait 10, 10 minutes left but we'll yeah. deal with that when it comes but okay um, Going back to the original thought of, you know, how are you getting these players to buy into this USL2 structure? Because I know even if you have the relationships in place, sometimes it's difficult for players who might want to enjoy their summer or, you know, might not be that familiar with the players around them. So how are you getting these players to really realize how important this USL2 season is within their development and making sure they stay on top of what they're doing? Yeah, and honestly, I give a lot of credit to the players. You know, I think it's helped that we've had so, such success um, and guys have gotten professional opportunities from it too. So I think those two things um, are always, you know, help push, uh, you know, push players over the line a little bit if they're maybe a little bit reluctant. And then, I mean, I think these places are, there's so many cool environments in USL too. I went up and watched Christian play a game for Ballard. And I mean, what an amazing experience. You know, we had Alex Levengood, who was at Vermont Green. And I mean, what, there's just so many really cool experiences. So, you know, really it's, you know, that side of it is you guys, these are really like little professional clubs and you can ingrain yourself in the, in the community while getting, you know, games, you know, on top of that. So I think it's just, yeah, continuing to have those discussions, continuing to push that individual development model of, you know, really that springtime. It's like, guys, you want to get 15 games in that second half of the season and, you know, get to that 32, 33 number i think is a you know pretty good number over over um you know 10 months of the season so yeah a lot of the credit goes to the guys i think a lot of the credit goes to usl2 as well for putting out a really good product quite honestly from for essentially an amateur league you know the i mean there's games like i think little rock had eight nine thousand people at their games you know there's so i think there's really really cool environments all over you know all over the country and i think that's also what excites our guys too yeah, completely. I mean, I think that goes back into what you said earlier about, 
you know, the professional aspect, you know, giving them a taste by playing as professional clubs. I think that gives them a better insight. And also when you have players that might use it as a stepping stone to get to the next level, I think that provides a great example. But, you know, I also think, like you said, you know, talking to these players and telling them, hey, this is a 15 game season. And, you know, I think again, goes back to the pro example. So I think that's a really good example. And, you know, progressing a little bit forward into your personal career, you know, I think that stop at Virginia is also really curious to me because I think, for me, that was really the first time, you know, you've talked about building a program throughout so much of this, but, you know, your stop at Virginia was the first time where you kind of went to a program that was very, very established and there was less of a program building and more of a program maintaining. And obviously I know, you know, you won a national championship there and you know, had a ton of success there, but, you know, what was that experience like for you and how was that a little bit different than the rest of the stops on your way? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it was, you know, player management, you realize how important player management is, in you know, every aspect of, you know, of coaching, you know, and even at that, where I think it's like, you know, in some cases, you could, <laughs> we could have probably just rolled out the ball in, in some of those games and not, you know, not not done a whole lot. And we probably would have won the game, you know, anyways, as talented as that team was, but those guys all needed something still, they still needed you. And I think the player management piece of how you related to them, you know, those guys are still struggling, you know, guys still struggle through things, you know, college is hard, especially at an academic institution like Virginia, you know, mental health obviously is, is a, you know, paramount in college athletics. Um, You know, so I think that was really, really, really learn that, you know, no matter the level of the player, they always need you in some capacity. They still need you to be in their corner. They still, you know, I, I still remember, you know, Daryl DK, you know, we had our Tuesday, Tuesday afternoon chats with Daryl and, you know, it's, you know, whatever he needed to, to make sure that he could, um, you know, feel in, in the best place to perform well and, and also just, you know, enjoy his time while he was there. So I think that player, um, I think that player management was, you know, really, really big there. And then I think also it just also reaffirmed the culture piece too. Of even, you know, at that place, I you know you could get, um, you had access to every, you know, top player in the country. You know, I think that's where it's like recruiting takes on a little bit of a different word where you're more choosing than recruiting, um, you know, but I think it's also making sure you're choosing the right players that have the right character. And I think that's what, you know, everyone asks what I'm chasing here and, and goals and aspirations. It's really, I'm trying to find the people, you know, and character that was on the 2016 Denver team, on the 2007 Concordia team, on the 2019, you know, Virginia team, because ultimately it was the people, you know, on those teams that, you know, led us to, you know, the successes that we had. Yeah, completely. I think great point there at the end with that you know, the idea of talent only takes you so far and that idea of culture is so important. And you know, I think also one thing that really interesting made interested me there that you touched on of, you know, more not necessarily player development, but kind of critiquing little things along the way is, you know, you've talked so much about the idea of pro aspects, you know, give them the idea of San Diego State. Was that something that kind of went into your plan at Virginia? Obviously, I know your main focus is winning games at the college level, but when you're dealing with players that are higher level that might you know, obviously, you know, we spoke on it earlier that, you know, every every single player who plays in college has somewhat of pro aspirations, but, you know, especially you see at a program like Virginia, was that something that kind of went into the player critiquing aspect of, you know, trying to help them with these little details of preparing them for the next level? I mean, I know Daryl DK's went on to have a very successful career from that team. There's There's been others as well, but, you know, how much of that, you know, just little player development is necessarily geared toward college versus, you know, next level and beyond? Yeah, um, I, you know, and I, I always tell the players and I tell, you know, players in the recruiting process right now is, you know, I will, you know, support your professional aspirations. I think the thing you have to, you know, meet me halfway out and I'm always going to be honest also about where I think you are in your professional, um, you know, journey and you can, you know, take that for however you want. Um, but, you know, I always will, will be honest with you, you know, I'll help you along the way. But I think for me, I, what I say all the time in the tagline we have in our program is actions must meet ambition. So, you know, the guys I can, you know, sit down and work with you all I want on video and everything else like that. But at the end of the day, like the things that you're doing to improve yourself on and off the field, those actions are what are going to make you a professional um, and whether or not you're going to be a professional for a long, long time or have a, you know, be able to sign a short term contract. And I think that's the other side of it. We talk about a lot is, you know, I want to give you a professional career. You know, I don't want you to just have, you know, a professional contract. And I think it's all the other things that we talk about in terms of the sports performance, how you take care of your body, 
um, how you, you know, do your prehab, how you do your rehab, how you do, you know, your recovery, how you're sleeping, what's your nutrition like, you know, those are all the things on top of being, you know, talented and being a good person, you know, they're going to have, you know, help you have a professional career. So I think that's, you know, the big difference, you know, that we talked about certainly there. And, you know, we've tried to, you know, obviously carry over here because it's hard. I mean, last year was the hardest year. Um, you know, I think with the start of MLS next pro, um, they needed to fill the rosters from, you know, that perspective. And, you know, I don't know, you know, how many players left that were fully ready. And I'm not just talking about my team. I'm just talking about, you know, in the entire U S soccer landscape. So, um, you know, it'll be really interesting to see where that league goes and how each player that's in it, you know, develops I'm rooting for them all, of course. Um, but like I said, I think it'll just be really interesting where, you know, where things go from there. Yeah, completely agree with you on everything you said. And I think the point you bring up the MLS next pro and how the landscape is changing is a very interesting aspect. And I think kind of goes unnoticed by a lot of people, just, you know, how soccer in the U.S. is constantly evolving in the pro setting. And I really do want to continue this conversation. We're about to run out of time. So <laughs> I think I'll end it right here and then I'll send you okay. another link real quick. So really appreciate it. And of just course. cut you off at any point. So I'll send okay. you a link in a minute.